Making a choice in life and weighing up the consequences, we may reason, OK, well, how bad can it get? So we're going to take a job that we don't see ourselves doing for a long time, but we need it. How bad could it get? Or meeting somebody you think about marriage. Yes, there are some glaring differences, but he's cute and you're cute and you both like pasta. So how bad could it get? Well, a bricklayer found out how bad it could get. He made a series of decisions that put him in hospital. Filling out the accident report form for his insurance company, here's the letter he wrote. I put poor planning as the cause of my accident and you said I should explain more fully. I trust the following details will be sufficient. I am a bricklayer. I was working alone on the roof of a ten-story building. I had a pile of heavy bricks left over. Rather than carry them down by hand, I decided to lower them to the ground in a barrel using a pulley attached to the side of the building at the tenth floor. Securing the rope at ground level, I went to the roof and loaded the bricks. Then I went back down to the ground and untied the rope, holding it tightly to ensure a slow descent of the heavy bricks. I'm not a big person, and due to my surprise at being jerked off the ground so suddenly, I lost my presence of mind and I forgot to let go of the rope. I proceeded at a rapid rate up the side of the building. In the vicinity of the fifth floor, I met the barrel coming down. This explains the fractured skull and the broken collarbone. I continued my rapid ascent, not stopping until the fingers of my right hand were two knuckles deep into the pulley. By this time, I regained my presence of mind and was able to hold tightly to the rope despite my pain. At approximately the same time, however, the barrel hit the ground and the bricks fell out so that the barrel now weighed less than me. I began a rapid descent down the side of the building. In the vicinity of the fifth floor, I met that barrel coming up again. This accounts for the two fractured ankles and lacerations of my legs and lower body. The second encounter with the barrel slowed me enough to lessen my injuries when I fell into the pile of bricks and three vertebrae were cracked. I'm sorry to report, however, that as I lay there on the bricks in pain, unable to stand, watching the empty barrel ten stories above me, I again lost my presence of mind and I let go of the rope. How bad can it get? Pretty bad. And turning now to Psalm 142, it got pretty bad for David and it's no joking matter. In fact, as a life lesson, there is a rule from David's experience worth keeping in mind. Life is not fair. Get used to it. Don't expect life to be easy. That's one of the messages that Jesus left with his disciples. But God promises to resource us with strength and power to help us get through. But here's the issue. Is that always true? The big question we will ask at some time in our lives is, does the maker of the stars hear the sound of my breaking heart? We cry out to God and the sound back is silence or no. And we wonder where is God in this the longer I live, I've come to understand that life is often a series of troubles. 
And this is why I want us to look at David's experience in Psalm 142. First, look at the reality of what is happening. The psalm is a masculine of David when he was in the cave of prayer. So it's a prayer from a cave. And we get a glimpse of a very dark time in David's life. There were two cave experiences in David's life. Running from King Saul, who was jealous of his popularity, he took refuge in the cave of Adullam, and he was in desperate trouble. After some time, David was again running from King Saul, and this time into the wilderness of En Gedi. It was then that David had the opportunity to kill Saul, but didn't, as that was not his right. It seems that Psalm 142 and Psalm 57 are his cave of Adullam experience. It was there that he was truly alone for a long time, with his life hanging by a thread. I visited this cave... But most tourists don't make the trip because it's a distance from Jerusalem and the parking for coaches is also at a distance. The most striking thing about this cave on a hill is that it overlooks the valley where David killed Goliath. What a triumph that was as he came to the attention of the nation. But now David would be thinking... How far things have fallen. Samuel had anointed me to be king when an ordinary teenager looking after dad's sheep. I play a musical instrument well and that meant King Saul's mood swings led to his advisers suggesting music to soothe him. That's when I got the call to the palace. Time passed and trouble with the Philistines meant Israel needed a person to battle it out against that giant Goliath. I stepped up and won. I rose through the army ranks, becoming a leader of men, and much to the envy of Saul, who is out to kill me, and now I'm on the run. I tried going into Philistine enemy territory, but that wasn't the wisest option. Now here I am in a cave. That's the reality of David's circumstances. It will sound familiar to some people I know. We don't name our cave-like experience Adullam. It goes by another name. It may be called the Cave of Bitterness. A young man was serving Christ and seeing blessing. His wife had a stillborn baby. After crying with her in the hospital room, he went to his car and sat there for a long time, yelling, Why, God? Can't you save a little baby? He was bitter. After this, he couldn't talk to God. He didn't want to go to church. I will be faking it, he said. For some people, the cave is called anger. A father lost his young daughter. Someone said to him, Don't stop believing in God. He replied, Don't worry about me. I won't stop believing in God. I just hate him, that's all. I know some people who are living in the cave called Hurt at the funeral for a little baby who died after taking just a few breaths. The funeral director tried comforting the dad. Well, at least he died as a baby and you didn't know him yet. He thought to himself, but that's my problem. I didn't know him and I wanted to know him. I will never watch him grow up. I will never teach him how to ride a bike. That's my problem. God, why did you take him from me? He said to his wife, I love you and I'll always be here for you, but I don't know if I will ever smile again. My hope today is that we will do more than name our cave, but find a way 
of coping. We can't always get out of the cave as and when we like, but we can learn from David. The kind of reaction that brings us through the experience without it destroying us. And isn't that what we need to know? So look at the two ways that David faced dark times in his life. He talked to God honestly and he talked to himself hopefully. And having this approach will make a huge difference for the better. Look at David's honesty as he prays, and this is always a good way to approach God. After all, he knows what we are feeling anyway. I cry aloud to the Lord. I lift up my voice to the Lord for mercy. Notice how loud this prayer is. And remember that Jesus prayed from the cross with a loud voice and the writer to the Hebrews tells us that during the day of Jesus' life on earth he offered up prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears to the one who could save him from death and he was heard because of his reverent submission. And notice David says, I pour out my complaint before him. Before him, I tell my trouble. This doesn't mean he was grumbling against God. He is giving voice to his troubles. When my spirit grows faint within me, it is you who know my way. In the path where I walk, men have hidden a snare for me. David feels like everywhere he goes, traps are set for him and he hasn't any friends left. Look to my right and see no one is concerned for me. I have no refuge. No one cares for my life. In ancient times, they spoke about looking to their right for friends. Somebody to trust and who cares. But you see what's happening? He feels utterly alone. Some of you may be feeling this. Sometimes we lack the courage to say it because we can't say something like that, can we? Well, David did. And there are times when we cry out to God and feel he has turned away from us. Where is God at such dark times? He doesn't seem to care. Take a moment to think about this. I had a, a series of emails from a mum and dad. Their son is in his early 20s. He had dedicated himself to the service of Christ and this took him abroad. His dad needed to fly out to get him home as he had experienced a really bad nervous breakdown. But he only wanted to serve Christ. You know what? That stuff happens a lot and we don't get it. We don't understand. Why is it that someone who has loved and served Christ all their life is just coming to retirement age and they end up with multiple tumours in their body and die in pain? Mark this down. David does not run from God but to God. This is an intense prayer in a song format. And a crisis does have a way of changing casual prayers to urgent ones. And when we feel that God must be numbered among those who aren't concerned for us because we have no refuge and no one cares for my life, like David, hold nothing back from God. The worst thing we can do in difficulty is wallow in self-pity. These cave-like experiences are perplexing. So how do I understand it when God is all I've got left, but he seems to have left? We do believe that he is our refuge, but it just doesn't seem that way right now. We're struggling with our doubts. 
because of our desperate unmet needs. Well, David has been in that place before us. We grope for answers, but there are some reasons why God seems to be holding back. Sometimes our request is wrong. What does it say in James? We pray and don't receive because we ask with the wrong motives. Take note of that. God, I want to get married because I'm lonely. That's not a good enough reason. Don't get married until you really know it's the right person. You need to marry a person in it for the long run and they need that from you. The disciples are often poster people for those who make wrong requests. They're on top of a mountain with Jesus. Suddenly Moses and Elijah turn up. That's cool. And Jesus dazzles in white, a bright light, like a light shining through a sheet. That's happening. They see the deity of Christ shining through him. They want this experience to last and the request is denied. You see, there is a boy at the bottom of this mountain who needs to be healed. So there are lives to be changed at the bottom of this mountain. Furthermore, as Psalm 66 says, If I had cherished sin in my heart, the law would not have listened. We should not expect to get our prayers answered. Why would God do that? We don't honour him. Yes, he still loves us and wants to answer our requests, but not if we sin. And what is sin? It's an archery term in the Greek language, meaning missing the mark. God's will is to stay true to people and centred on him through his word. When we aim for that, God will open a window in heaven. If we don't, God still loves us, but we won't get the blessing. You see, sometimes our request is wrong and sometimes we are in the wrong. And also, just maybe this is a test. God isn't testing us to find what we are made of. He knows what we're made of. Sometimes we're in caves to get character. It's where we get depth and start growing up. We know this, don't we? But this is what I want to underline. At times, the pain is too much. Sometimes our faith is not strengthened by fire. It's melted by fire. Anybody listening know that? Visit Auschwitz and you will learn how about 20% of the prisoners became resolute, but many became like animals. It was just too much. Oh, and by the way, people may say that God leaves us alone because we're paying for our sins, and that's not always the case. Honestly, I get tired of people saying, the reason you're going into a cave-like experience is because you're just not a good enough Christian. You must have unconfessed sin in your life. You're walking away from God. That may be the case, but often that's not true. This is not who God is. If we want to find out where God is, look at the person with the humble and broken spirit. That's where he lives. Psalm 34. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted. He saves those who are crushed in spirit. That's where God is. He is always close to the brokenhearted. But I hope we get this. Maybe the cave is where we are supposed to be for now, but not forever. Though I walk through the valley, through, we go through the valley, we don't fly over it. This is where we find how much God loves us. He comes to the brokenhearted, and please hear this. We will never know Christ closer than when we suffer. We may not feel it, but it's still true. That's where he is. So we cry out, what a waste. When a believer dies of cancer, it does hurt. 
but it's not a waste. Don't take this fact away from a dying person. Death is a means of getting more of Christ. There is something better. Don't take that away from the sufferer. But it's important to notice that David is talking to God honestly and also talking to himself hopefully. From verse 5 he makes a shift and affirms what he knows about God. I cry to you, O Lord. I say, you are my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. Listen to my cry, for I am in desperate need. Rescue me from those who pursue me, for they are too strong for me. Did you notice the uncertainty and certainty all mingling together in his prayer? The hopefulness mingling with the, I do hope so, Lord. Set me free from my prison that I may praise your name. You see what he's doing? Crying out to God. He is confused and doubting, but that's not the same as unbelief. And we are allowed to have doubts, as David had, because he was in desperate need. There is a clear distinction between doubt and unbelief. Unbelief is often the outcome of a willful refusal of God. Doubt is not the opposite of faith. Unbelief is. Don't be too hard on doubt. We are allowed to have doubts. To say like David, you are my refuge. That's super confident. But in the next breath, listen to my cry. I'm in a desperate state. I'm not strong enough to cope. I want to praise your name, but I don't feel free enough at the moment to do it. Set me free from my prison. We are allowed to say, I don't understand. The German theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer was an incredible man of God. He lived during the time of Nazi Germany and he took a stand against Nazism and was imprisoned. During that time, he wrote a poem which is very reflective of what we are thinking about now. He wrestled with this fact of trusting God and knowing and believing he's with us. Who am I? They often tell me that I would step from my prison cell poised, cheerful and sturdy like a nobleman from his country estate. Who am I? They often tell me I would speak with my guards freely, pleasantly and firmly as if I had it to command. Who am I? I have also been told that I suffer the days of misfortune with serenity, smiles and pride as someone accustomed to victory. Am I really what others say about me or am I only what I know of myself, restless, yearning and sick, like a bird in a cage struggling for the breath of life, as though someone were choking my throat, hungering for colours, for flowers, for the songs of birds, thirsting for kind words and human closeness, shaking with anger at capricious tyranny and the pettiest slurs bedeviled by anxiety, awaiting great events that might never occur, fearfully powerless and worried for friends far away, weary and empty in prayer, in thinking, in doing, weak and ready to take leave of it all. Who am I? This man or that other? Am I then this man today and tomorrow another? Am I both all at once? An imposter to others, but to me little more than a whining, despicable weakling. Does what is in me compare to a vanquished army that flees in disorder before a battle already won? Who am I? They mock me those lonely questions of mine. Whoever I am, you know me, O God. 
You know I am yours. Admitting to doubt doesn't mean we are insulting God. But faith does not feed on thin air, but on facts. I watched a TV documentary where nervous people were being helped to fly as passengers by an airline. The way they were helped was by giving lots of information and then carefully testing it out. It's the same when we are struggling in the dark. So go for what we know of God and his ways. That's what David does as he talks to himself about God. When my spirit grows faint within me, it is you who knows my way. I say, you are my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. David knows the promises and character of God, and he reminds himself of these truths in his despair. Have we grasped this so important fact? Our confidence in God doesn't happen automatically. Think and thank God for what he has done, is doing and will do. Do we see this? David's prayer is both honest and hopeful. And there's good reason for it. He is talking to the Lord who created everything and promised him a future. The prophet Samuel had anointed him as king and looking forward, David knows the righteous will gather about me because of your goodness to me. And they did. Right now, his cave experience points him in the direction of despair. But God's promise pointed him in another direction. And yes, right now, we may feel we're in a cave experience and it feels like it's all over. But it's never over for a child of God. Call on God and count on God. He has promised us eternal life. He has promised that we will reign with him for all eternity and he will sustain us to the end and with him there is no end. So we feel no one cares for our life. God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So we say with confidence, notice we can say it, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? Actually, man can do a lot. And that's why these truths can quickly vanish from our minds when we're in a cave. So bring them to mind by our thankfulness and praise. Look, if we will not put our faith in him, what alternative have we? Listen to these words from someone who knows what it's like to be in dark places and cave experiences. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you.